once yeah once the once we started having weekly telecons and holding each other accountable um the paper really came together in a hurry so michael kramer de really deserves the credit as the leader of this endeavor as he has been for many years um dick manchester at atnf in australia uh wrangled the parks data and uh worked out you know, had to do with the uh, the dispersion measure variations <coughs> and I mean, Alex. Norbert Vex is our resident GR expert. Adam Deller is our resident VLBI expert. And Bill Coles uh, knows everything about the interstellar medium and uh, covariances and fitting and, and things like that. And um, me, well, I did things here and there and uh, helped figure out a lot of those systematics in the data along the way. So we have this 50-odd uh, page paper that came out in uh, PhysRev X in December. And so what I'm going to do is show you the highlights of that and try to put it into some uh, coherent form. So, you know, if you do go and read the, uh, the whole work later on, you'll have the big context for it. So we'll start off with uh, just an introduction to pulsars and pulsar timing so that you understand the techniques that we're using. So I'll just remind you, pulsars are what's left over in terms of the core of the star after a massive, say, 8 to 10 solar mass or so star has uh, undergone a supernova explosion. So you're left with a mass of, you know, around the Chandrasekhar mass, maybe a bit more in some cases, so something like one and a half solar masses. Radius somewhere around 10 kilometers. We can uh, talk a bit more about that uh, later on. Magnetic fields have quite a huge range. They're all much, much larger than the surface magnetic field of the Earth, 0.5 Gauss, right? So many orders of magnitude bigger. And the spin rates also have a, a large range, going from tenths of a hertz for the very slow pulsars to over 700 hertz for the fastest one. So altogether, this forms a, an environment that is very different from anything we can produce in a laboratory on Earth. So the little gif here is just a, a cartoon showing a very magnetized neutron star, um, somebody's not muted, I think. Uh, and so the red lines are intended to illustrate uh, magnetic dipole or fields. And as you can see from the spinning, at some point, those field lines would not be able to close if they were forced to rotate with the neutron star, they would be forced to move faster than the speed of light. So this defines a region near the magnetic poles here where the field lines are open. And it's along those lines that we think the pulsar emission, radio emission anyway, is produced. The high energy emission probably comes from other places in the magnetosphere for the most part. So, you know, this is a very cartoonish model, but it turns out that that's quite um, adequate for, uh, um, sorry, dealing with the, uh, the timing that we need to do. So just to introduce the double pulsar in particular, this is um, a, you know, the only double pulsar observed to date. Um, we keep an eye on some of the other ones checking for companions, but we haven't found anything yet. Um, and it is special in the sense that it really has a set of extreme orbital properties that you know, make it a gold mine for doing all kinds of physics with it. So it has, you know, a very, very tight orbit. It's two and a half hours. The typical velocities are something like 300 kilometers per second, so percent of the speed of light. The separation between the two objects is about three light seconds in general. The eccentricity is also reasonably big, which is something you expect after a pair of supernova explosions that still allows the, uh, the system to remain bound. What's also very cool about it is that it, the orbit is nearly edge on to our line of sight, which means that we are very sensitive to the Shapiro delay in the system. Um, you know, we couldn't have ordered a more perfect system if we had tried, I think. So just to be clear on the types of pulsars that we have, we have one young pulsar, which is pulsar B, that's the one that formed recently. And then pulsar A, which is the focus of most of the timing that we have done here, is what we call a recycled pulsar. So the progenitor to pulsar B dumped matter and uh, angular momentum onto pulsar A as pulsar B's progenitor was you know, going through, well, it's giant phase or evolving at any rate. 
uh, the orbit might have been pretty tight already, so it wouldn't have had the opportunity to expand a whole lot. And there may have been common envelope evolution in there. But the point is that Pulsar A got recycled to a, a very fast spin period, 22.7 milliseconds, at a comparatively low magnetic field. Pulsar B, formed second, you know, was just uh, the typical young pulsar that uh, we often see with the spin period of a few seconds. Um, Excuse me, but one thing about pulsar B is we don't actually see it as a pulsar these days. Um, it was visible as a pulsar back in 2003, and that's what this plot is showing here. But its profile changed over time, and in you know late 2008 or so, it basically disappeared. And this is because after those supernova explosions, certainly the, the second one, by default, you expect the spin axes of both neutron stars to be misaligned with the orbital angular momentum. In fact, for A, we think that the misalignment is minuscule, but for B, it, it could be pointing somewhere totally different. And so that leads to a geodetic precession effect. And what that means is that B's spin axis has precessed so much that we don't see it as a pulsar anymore. We think that it should be coming back within a few years. So every time we take data on the system, we search through the data to see if B is back. Um, but it hasn't shown up again yet. So that's about all I'm going to say about B, except that the, the timing that uh, we have been able to do on it in the past helps us get the mass ratio between the two objects, just from the you know, teeter-totter balance principle. So we're really focusing on pulsar A at this point. So why do we care so much about doing this? Why do we really want to do tests of general relativity or, or other theories of gravity with this? Well, it's because pulsars test a rather unique regime here. So this plot, sorry, I, no, I don't want to do that. Sorry, back, back, okay. Uh, this plot shows um, sort of the, the strength of uh, the gravitational potential here on this axis. This is a logarithmic scale. So, um, you know, things like Sagittarius A star are here. This is, uh, and, you know, double neutron star systems are up here. And these are the, uh, the LIGO events here. So testing, uh, you know, very close into the, the neutron star. We're a little bit farther out. Um, there's a pulsar triple system here. And this is the, the space-time curvature here, right? So it's actually fairly small for, you know, large black holes for the solar system. When you get into the double neutron star systems, you're really in a regime where you're in tight, uh, tightly curved space time. And this is interesting and important because many alternate theories of gravity um, predict you know, effects that will come into play in these tightly curved space times in the case of strongly self-gravitating objects, which a neutron star certainly is something like 10, 12, 15% of its energy, of its masses and you know, binding energy. So the uh, number of neutrons that you naively think about, if you take the mass of those and then think about them actually as a neutron star, the true mass of the neutron star is about 10, 15% lower than you know, N times the number of, uh, you know, the number of baryons, sorry, times the, the neutron mass. So because of this, um, this structure, the internal structure of the neutron stars, some alternate theories predict, you know, different coupling to different parameters of alternate theories. And so the neutron star binaries like this really provide a unique situation to make tests of these particular theories. And so I'm going to show you a couple of results of those later on. Of course, in GR, the internal structure of an object has no bearing on its response to a gravitational field, right? So that's uh, the gold standard that we're comparing against. Okay, whoops. So just a little bit about observing. Um, you know, the individual pulses that we see are actually pretty different for ordinary pulsars. And there's no reason to suspect that uh, the individual pulses of 0737 are different. Here's an example of a boring slow pulsar with the spin period, you know, around a second or so. Each horizontal line here represents one pulse, right? So this is a bright pulsar, so you can really see the individual pulses clearly. You can see there's a huge variation in shape and flux density. Sometimes you see the interpulse here, sometimes you don't. Um, so it looks like quite a mess here. But the key thing about pulsars is that if you add up the pulses 
over you know several hundred pulses to a few thousand pulses, you get a stable profile. That's what's illustrated at the bottom here. And so since that is reproducible, that uh, becomes a key feature that you take advantage of when trying to do pulsar timing. One other uh, point to make is that uh, we use the highest precision possible instrumentation to take our data. And in particular, this means using the rather compute intensive procedure known as coherent dispersion. So, you know, the interstellar medium is a little bit ionized and that results in a non-zero plasma frequency. And so it delays the arrival of low frequency radio waves relative to the high frequency ones. And it follows this one over frequency squared law. Um, so the amount of the delay uh, is uh, proportional to the dispersion measure, which is basically just the column density of electrons between the, uh, between the Earth and the pulsar. And that can change a little bit over time, which is something we have to account for. But basically, it's, it's, you know, the changes are part in 10 to the 4 or something like that over time. So mostly you know, the, the DM that we use for observing can be considered well known. And so if you take the data stream from your radio telescope, you have a few choices for how to deal with it. The sort of old fashioned analog hardware way is to you know, build a set of very narrow filters and pipe your data through that so that you get uh, you know, the signal from each of many little frequency channels. And then you can detect the signal in those frequency channels and sum them up. And that will give you something that looks like this, where the filter shape is convolved with your pulse profile. That doesn't give you the best possible timing, right? This is the same pulse I observed with the superior coherent dispersion technique. And you can see there are sharp features in here, which turn out to be very useful for timing. So that's what we do. And it involves basically sampling the full electric field coming from the telescope. So you get amplitude and phase information. And then you can treat the dispersion measure effect as a set of phase wraps, basically. And if you know the, the value of the dispersion measure, you can apply the inverse of the filter to it. So the, we do that by you know, taking a chunk of data, Fourier transforming it to the frequency domain, applying the inverse filter through multiplication, Fourier transforming back. And that lines up the pulse perfectly. So we recover all the sharp features and you know, there's a few instruments, those of you who use the GBT might have, have heard of those, it's uh, less important than, uh, than the concept. Um, when you get these sharp features, that is what allows you to do the precision pulsar timing. So here is uh, how that works for the, the double pulsar in particular. This is its profile here. So this is what we call a standard profile. It's built up out of many, many hours of observations. This is at 820 megahertz with the Green Bank Telescope. And you can see it's extremely high signal to noise. And we have a lot of sharp little features, right? There's a point there, there's some you know, up and down wiggles there. These are actually part of the profile and they matter. Any given observation, say a 30 second observation is going to look like that standard profile because of the reproducibility with extra noise, right? And some phase offset in general. You can see all the features are there. The little wiggles are there, the peak is there. You know, it basically looks the same, but with added noise. So what we do is take the phase offset between the two doing a cross correlation. And we typically do this in the frequency domain using a large number of harmonics. So we cut it off before the noise becomes a big problem. And we get a very precise value of this phase offset between the two. Now, once the pulsar um, properties are sort of established uh, after discovery, then we can usually convert that phase offset to a time offset by knowing the period of the pulsar when we take that observation. So then we have a time offset from where we think the pulsar should have landed, right? And we also have a reference clock at the observatory, usually a hydrogen maser that gives us the start time of the observation. So if we put those pieces of information together, we get a time of arrival. So TOA, we're going to be talking a lot about those as we go through the next bit of the talk. And then to actually do the pulsar timing procedure, we first have to take our collection of TOAs and for the double pulsar, um, it's you know on the order of a million TOAs that we have now. 
Um, we have to transform all of them from the frame of reference of the telescope to the solar system barycenter. And then we do the trick where we actually assign a rotation number to each and every time of arrival that we have. So this is developing what we call a phase connected solution or a phase coherent solution. And this allows us to you know, have zero uncertainty in the rotation number that we're dealing with. So over the course of you know, now 16 years of timing, right, we know exactly how many times the double pulsar has rotated. And the lack of uncertainty in that translates into high precision and things like the spin and the spin down rate and all of the other parameters that we want to measure. So these sharp profiles are really key to doing this properly. So once we have a, uh, a fit to all of the pulsar parameters, we want to make sure it's good. And so we do that by evaluating the fit residuals. So we take the actual times of arrival minus the ones predicted by our best fit model and look at the set of residuals. This is not the double pulsar, but it's an example from Nanograv with a lot of data in it uh, with different telescopes and instruments represented by the different colors here. And so you're looking for each of the data subsets to be roughly normally distributed, um, you know, not to have any big bumps and wiggles going through here. You know, we want to make sure that we've actually modeled everything. So it was, you know, staring at residuals for the double pulsar that was um, holding us up for a long time. We kept finding things and funny correlations between residuals and we needed to clean all of those things up in order to get a really good solution. So here's the data set on Pulsar A. As I said, Pulsar B, we really don't see anymore. So we've refocused everything in the recent paper on timing um, Pulsar A. So I pointed out the GBT residuals because I, I gave a version of this talk to NRAO uh, some time ago, but I, I, I think it's still worth pointing out because uh, the, the NRAO telescope there has really been the driver of the highest precision timing here. Without it, we wouldn't have the results that we have now. So this is an incredibly valuable resource. But this is just to give you an idea of how much data we have, right? The parks data goes back to 2003. This is modified Julian date down here, so not, not terribly <laughs> helpful. Um, the GBT data, we started coherent dispersion observations um, you know, around 2004 or so. And we kept going with the you know, fairly narrow band instrument for a while. And nowadays we've been using a much wider band instrument. So we've improved our sensitivity quite a lot over the you know, last decade. And we've brought in data from all kinds of other telescopes, Nasse, Vesterborg, Jodrell, Effelsberg. Right? So some of them only got going you know, once they installed their own big coherent dispersion wide band machines, but they've all contributed to the data set. And you'll notice that we have uh, many subbands of the GBT data. This is to help us fit for variations in the dispersion measure. So, and then also that's, that's done at the lower frequencies at, uh, at other telescopes as well. So I keep talking about variations in dispersion measure because that is one of the things that we had to do a significant battle with in order to um, develop a, a good solution. So we have this little um, schematic in our paper explaining how everything is interconnected and I'll try to do that in our talk as well. So to understand the timing properly, we actually need to know the distance to the pulsar. We need to know what's going on with the interstellar medium. And we sort of have to fit those things separately um, and then sample from the results of those fits in order to get a good timing model. Um, so everything ends up being interconnected it's all in the end a fully coherent story that uh, that works quite well together and fully self-consistent, which you know is certainly reassuring. But uh, each of these things to do with the interstellar medium has actually proven to be something we really need to understand well. So we did things a little bit differently for uh, the, the fitting. Instead of fitting everything all together, we, uh, First, and this was Dick Manchester's work, we first binned all of the data down to four minute integrations, which gave the best signal at parks anyway. Um, and this was used to derive dispersion measure and also any common mode. So um, it, not following one over frequency squared law, but uh, frequency independent offsets at, at 100A intervals. This can happen because of jitter in the pulsar, for example. Um, and so, 
this was uh, fit, you know, using a couple of different um, stride lengths for determining the, the dispersion measure. So 100 day intervals or Monte Carloing with different uh, intervals, just try to get an idea of the changing dispersion measure over time. Doing this certainly with the Monte Carlo uh, gave us the confidence that we were correctly dealing with the covariance between the dispersion measure, the common mode offsets and the astrometry. So position, proper motion and, and timing parallax. So just to show you then what, uh, what that looks like, this is the um, kind of curve, I think part of the curve got left out of this picture. Anyway, <laughs> that's unfortunate. Um, uh, I've recently had to change everything over to Keynote from PowerPoint and this didn't come through. So this is supposed to be showing the Gaussian process behind here as a sort of a smooth, cur uh, smooth curve um, going behind there. So we took basically that, that those four minute uh, timing fit dispersion measure results and fit a, a Gaussian learning process to them with a fairly small kernel length. And um, then we sampled from that Gaussian learning process result when we were actually doing the full timing model. So <clears throat> this was an iterative procedure and uh, you know, we were confident that it's all self-consistent in the end. So one of the things that uh, comes out of those dispersion measure changes is uh, the ability to do a, a structure function analysis. So one point you can get here, so this is the, the uh, uh, lag between um, days and the dispersion measure, so uh, logarithmic scale. And this is basically the um, uh, mean square DM difference uh, on that time scale, right? So the stuff from our DM curve is all up here. And down here, we have a point uh, resulting from looking at the scintillation of the pulsar. So how, how big the uh, bright and dim spots are uh, during one observation. And we can sort of uh, convert that to an equivalent uh, value here. So, Naively, you would expect the turbulent interstellar medium to have something like a, uh, a slope of five thirds, assuming Kolmogorov turbulence, excuse me. Um, so if you take the diffractive scintillation point and extrapolate upwards, it, it works pretty well. But then when you get into our data, the curve flattens off. So it's not following the Kolmogorov turbulence as a whole. The, uh, the amount of flattening, um, you know, Bill Coles uh, tells us, uh, indicates that there is a, a thin, thin screen within the interstellar medium, a thin layer with the thickness of about eight AU. And this is not unexpected. I mean, the interstellar medium has lots of density variations uh, in it. And in particular, this pulsar, sort of right on the edge of the gum nebula here. So this is a, an image from Perseladal uh, mapping this region and uh, the double pulsar is, oops, sorry, I can't click on it. Double pulsar is here uh, in red. There's another nearby pulsar there. Um, you know, the idea of having a, a thin scattering screen when you're near a nebula like this is entirely reasonable, right? Um, and in particular, we would think that this is consistent with the double pulsar being just behind the nebula, right? or just behind at least that screen within the nebula. It's a little hard to tell from this image, right? Where the nebula cuts off um, and so on. You would think that we could maybe get uh, some help from all of those models of, you know, how much ionized content there is in the galaxy in different directions. So in other words, uh, the use of many pulsars to make a relationship between DM and distance, but it doesn't really work out here because of this gum nebula, right? The simple models there contain just a circular model of the nebula, which is not super correct, obviously. And, you know, with the double pulsar winding up right on the edge there, it's a huge ambiguity as to whether it's in front of the nebula or behind the nebula. And the, the rough modeling that people do can't help us there. Um, but, you know, with the, uh, with the parallax that we have, which I'll be getting to in a bit, um, it actually fits really well with uh, being right behind the nebula. So, you know, we think the distance is, is something like 735 parsecs. 
based on, the, on that. So we get that from two different methods. So I mentioned that, you know, we were trying to do this dispersion measure fit with the Gaussian learning process and so on. And this should uh, account for all the covariances with astrometry and, and so on. So we should be able to measure timing parallax pretty well there. So the timing parallax is um, it's a result of so the signal coming from the pulsar uh, basically being a curved wavefront. Right? And so at different times in the Earth's orbit, we're actually sampling the, the curvature slightly differently. So we expect a, a you know, six month um, delay cycle in the timing effects from the, the timing parallax. This is you know, a distinct method from doing the LBI parallax where you're actually looking you know, as you would with uh, your eyes you know, on the sky or, or with a, an optical telescope where you're looking for the apparent movement of the pulsar across the sky. Okay, so it's a, it's a different approach. In principle, it should give you the same result. So, you know, we had uh, VLBA data here, which uh, Adam Deller reduced. And this is an example from the, the right ascension fit. And you can very clearly see the parallax signature here. Right, the, the one year periodicity in there. Um, lots of epochs, you know, we're sampling the times when we knew we should be at minima and maxima. Um, and then, you know, there's a sort of a range of solutions here showing the uh, uncertainty region on it. So the, um, the VLBI parallax is down here in black in the, the, the plot below here. And it has quite a small uncertainty. Right, it's about a ten percent uncertainty, and uh, you know we think this is pretty reliable. Right, Have a, having a look at this, the timing parallax is much less well measured. Right, it's got quite a, a large uncertainty there. It's not incompatible with the VLBI parallax. We decided for the paper to adopt the weighted mean of the two, which is only a teeny tiny bit uh, offset from the center of the, the plain VLBI parallax. Uh, oh, and this is done with the proper motion fix of the timing values, which is a detail. Um, so this seemed like the most reasonable way forward. Right? Over the years, there's been a lot of controversy about exactly where this pulsar is, right? with the dispersion measure modeling suggesting something like uh, 500 parsecs, an earlier parallax measurement being um, a fair bit higher. There's been a lot of movement back and forth, but we think we're finally honing in on the correct solution here. So uh, there's plenty of prospect for improvement of this in the future, which will, I think, be a very interesting thing to see. So having established what the distance is, um, we, and you know, accounted for the DM variations, now we can start to sample from these things and you know, do a Monte Carlo to get the actual best fit relativistic timing model. So there's a lot that goes into that. Um, in particular, we need to use much shorter integrations, 30 second integrations. And that's because we have this very, very short orbit, two and a half hours. I mentioned that we're sensitive to the Shapiro delay. That has a quite a sharp peak as the pulsar goes behind its companion. And if we use integration times of a minute or so, we actually smooth out that peak so much that we lose sensitivity to it. So 30 seconds is the best compromise we can find between good signal to noise and continued sensitivity to Shapiro delay in particular. So here are some bin residuals uh, with respect to orbital phase and then all of the, uh, the other residuals from the various telescopes at uh, as a function of time here. So, excuse me, um, this is, uh, you know, as I said, I think this one has been, these are the residuals as opposed to the plot I showed you before, which was when we had observations and what frequencies. We've mixed together the different uh, receivers at parks, different observing instruments at the GBT uh, observing modes. So, um, and we split the GBT into two panels. So the other, telescopes uh, you know give similar plots what i'd like you to take away from this is that you know the residuals do in general look normally distributed so we think <laughs> we've actually fit everything we need to fit so let's talk about what we actually measure then this is where we get into the gr tests so for any you know ordinary binary pulsar 
we effectively have a single line spectroscopic binary, right? as if uh, you were observing that in optical. So you're sensitive to the component of the pulsar's motion along the line of sight. <clears throat> so the projected velocity or you know, the projected size of the orbit. So the things you can measure for any binary pulsar would be the orbital period, the projected semi-major axis, which is why we've got the one here, the eccentricity of the orbit, the longitude of periastron and the time of periastron. Right. So those are, you know, just the Keplerian orbit description. For the relativistic systems, you can measure what we call these post-Keplerian parameters. And we measure them in a way that does not assume any particular theory of gravity is correct. So this is a formalism due to Damour and de Ruel from 1985, 1986. Um, and uh, this list of parameters are, is a list of things that we can, as I said, measure basically completely empirically without building in the assumption that GR is correct, for example. So we measure the advance of periastron. We actually measure it to the second post-Newtonian order. So we do have a dependence now on the moment of inertia of pulsar A, which I'll talk about in a bit. Gamma is a combined time dilation and gravitational redshift parameter. So that's the time dilation is averaged over the orbit um, and the gravitational redshift as well. They have the same effect on the signal that is basically representing climbing from the gravitational well of the binary as a whole out to us. And that's something you can really only measure if you have a significant periastron advance and, and can see the change in the projected orbit over time. The orbital period decay is, of course, the uh, due to gravitational radiation. We have to be a little careful now and include the effect of the pulsar's effective mass loss from its spinning down, right? So it's losing energy as it spins down, and this effectively um, corresponds to a, a mass loss in the system. Shapiro delay has two parameters, the shape, which corresponds to the inclination angle of the or orbit, and then the range, which in GR matches up to the companion mass. And we have new terms now. So these are sort of the classical five, which if you've ever heard me talk about relativistic pulses before, I've, I've mentioned before. But now we also measure a relativistic deformation of the orbit, which this is not the first system to do it in, but uh, you know, it's still nice that we got it. And we have a, a new parameter which um, combines the next leading order terms in both the Shapiro delay and aberration. And I'll talk about how that works in a, in a couple of slides. So here's a cartoon of some of the effects, the, the five basic ones, and I'll show what the other ones look like in a bit. So because you have this, um, you know, projected orbit, you are in general for an ordinary binary pulsar system, uh, not separately sensitive to the two masses or the inclination angle. Those three parameters are connected via the mass functions. So basically there are two unknowns, but you know, if you can measure multiple post Keplerian parameters, you can start to A, measure those two masses if you measure two parameters, or B, move to a self-consistency check for your theory of gravity if you measure three or more parameters. Because all of these PK parameters depend on the masses in different ways. And so you would hope that in any you know, plausible theory of gravity, they give you one consistent solution with a small error region. So we'll see that that does work for GR and not so much for some other theories. So here is the excuse me, the Shapiro delay curve, which is sort of one of the most spectacular effects that we measure. We've cast the orbital phase here so that um, the maximum effect uh, comes at 90 degrees. So this is that, that thing about the pulsar moving away from us at phase zero, being behind the companion at phase 90, and then coming back toward us at, at 180 degrees. Now, one trick is that the periastron longitude is shifting a lot, right? That's shifting by you know, 17 degrees per year. And so we actually have to take that into account when we are binning this plot here. So we're, we're always plotting the basically uh, true anomaly of, uh, of the pulsar instead of just the mean anomaly or anything like that. So we get everything you know, lined up in phase. So this is the full extent of the Shapiro delay signal, right? Which is pretty big, it's 140 microseconds. 
Unfortunately, we don't get to measure all of that. It turns out that you know if you just um, fit your Keplerian parameters, you can absorb some of the Shapiro delay signal into a redefinition of the size of the orbit of the projected semi-major axis. And so that's what's shown down here. So what we actually have to measure is only about 80 microseconds, still pretty big, right? And you can see that with our binned residuals here, we, we are very, very sensitive to that. And, and we clearly you know, have everything lining up nicely on the curve. So, you know, for less relativistic pulsars, it can become difficult to, to measure the Shapiro delay. Um, this curve also reinforces why we need those 30 second uh, time integrations, right? Because this is so sharply peaked here, we would not want to take too long an integration and smooth out our, our sensitivity here. What I'm showing in this plot here is the um, sort of naive Shapiro delay subtracted from the uh, actual binned residuals here. And you'll see that there's still some structure left. I think I've got a better thing on the next page. Um, it's a little smaller, but it will explain a little bit more what's happening. So if you just take the, the basic, you know, what, first post-Newtonian Shapiro delay and subtract it, you get this blue structure left. And there's a big bin with the, with the large uncertainty here where you're crossing zero. That is a big uncertainty because that's right where you get the eclipse of pulsar A, also by pulsar B. So let's not worry about that center bin too much, but look at the structure here. So this is a combination of two different effects, and this is what we call the next leading order terms. So there are two things going on here. If my fist is pulsar B and we've got pulsar A coming around here, as the pulsar, as the, as the Shapiro delay signal is traveling across the orbit, both pulsars are moving. Right, so that tiny shift in the position of B during the passage of the pulsar signal through the orbit gives you part of this signal here. The other component is an aberration term. So A is rotating here and sending off its signals toward us. And so the, the question is um, how much is the signal going to get deflected by pulsar B, and is that going to slow it down or speed it up? So the question is, if A is coming around this way, spinning this way, um, you'd expect it to be slowed down on this side, but to sort of whip around faster over on this side. And that's actually what we see. We see a delay in the signal as it uh, moves behind pulsar B, and we see the signal coming a little early as it moves away from pulsar B. So, it's just a slight change in the, um, effectively the angle from which we see the radiation, which translates into a, a difference in the um, time of arrival. So what this means is that we're able to distinguish between pulsar A rotating prograde to the orbit versus retrograde to the orbit. Um, now we had reasons beforehand for thinking that it was rotating prograde. And that's shown down here. This is from my former PhD student, Rob Ferdman's uh, modeling of the pulsar A profile um, to show that there was no change over time. A is not processing, not undergoing geodetic precession. So it had to be either prograde or retrograde. Prograde is more likely based on the um, uh, supernova explosion dynamics. It would take a lot to, to kick it to perfectly 180 degrees away. And then uh, there was another effort to model, model the B pulses um, a few years ago, which also strongly suggested that A was, uh, was prograde. This is the interaction between the A and B pulses, which I don't have time to get into. But uh, this really seals the deal, right? This, this delay on this side of the pulsar and uh, advancement on that side of, of pulsar B really shows for sure that A is rotating prograde and it you know, fits really neatly with everything that we um, had you know, worked out in principle beforehand. So that's a wonderful confirmation there. Excuse me, Ingrid, uh, there's yeah. a question by Rob Mann. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, I just wondered, you have red theoretical, black is the fit to the data, yeah. I assume the best fit. Theoretical what? Is that a GR curve or is that theoretical curve independent of the theory of gravity? Yeah, great question. No, that's that's a GR curve. 
-hmm. Yeah, that's uh, so this is, uh, you know, Norbert Vex's uh, work here, working out what it should be computing things to, to first post Newtonian order. So, um, yeah, we're, we're counting this as a, as a separate test. Well, so, I mean, the, the fit is, so what we do is we work out what this should be. And then, um, so the shape of the curve, um, I believe GR is assumed in this. No, it doesn't necessarily have to be actually. I should double check that. So, um, but um, the red curve does assume GR uh, because that's the size of the effect you expect in GR. And so what we're doing is, is um, yeah, we are measuring, we're basically scaling this curve when we do the measurement to uh, to get the uh, the size. So in some sense, there is a bit of GR dependence built in there, I guess. But the, that's just for that one aspect of it. Um, this plot here is uh, you know what everybody likes to see. Right? This is the decay of the orbit over time. Um, so this is the kind of plot that was made famous by the Hulse-Taylor pulsar, of course. Um, so what this is showing is the shift of periostron, so how much earlier periostron is happening over time based on the decay of the orbit due to the emission of gravitational radiation. So um, this, uh, you know, if you have no emission of gravitational waves, then you would expect that to have no shift whatsoever. Um, with GR, you expect this parabolic decay, and so that's the red prediction curve here. Um, and we fit every point you know, throughout the data set perfectly along that curve, just like for the Hulse-Taylor pulsar, we'll point that out. So um, you know, the amount we measure is completely consistent with the predictions of GR. And of course that makes everybody happy. Uh, again, it's important to point out this is testing the radiative sector of GR as opposed to just the, the quasi-static um, one, which you know involves the Shapiro delay and so on. So this is um, an important you know, mixed test of the, the system. Those of you who have heard me talk about this before know that there needs to be a kinematic correction to our measured uh, orbital period decay, our measured PB dot. Um, so that comes about because the solar system barycenter and the pulsar system center mass are not really inertial relative to each other. They're accelerating differently in the gravitational potential of the galaxy. And also the um, motion of the pulsar across the sky gives us a V squared over D term, right? The radial accelerations is sort of um, centripetal motion, if you will, um, which always looks like the pulsar is accelerating away from us. And so, those two, three terms, if you split up the potential into um, you know, disc and, and vertical, um, those several terms together give us a correction to the uh, observed PB dot value. So the, the amount of the correction here is shown. So this is the, uh, the galactic correction here as a function of distance to the pulsar. Um, this is the, the Shklovsky correction, that, that V squared over R term, and this is the sum here in black. So the actual correction isn't super sensitive to the distance, which is nice. Back when this paper was published, we thought the distance was out here at a kiloparsec or so. Um, now we know that it's down here at 735. Fractionally, this is pretty small. So for now, it doesn't matter a whole lot. As we uh, progress with more data, it is going to start mattering. And so we'll have to have a more precise distance measurement, which hopefully we will get with the SKA and so on down the road. Um, so here is the famous mass mass diagram uh, in GR. So this is the self consistency test that I was talking about. This is the big picture here, plotting masses from zero to three for pulsar A and pulsar B. And this is taking each of those measured PK parameters um, not the, the nonlinear one, right? But um, each of the measured PK parameters and computing what the curves would correspond to in terms of the two masses. Right? So there are thicknesses to each of these lines which represent the uncertainties. <laughs> okay, you just can't see them on the, the top plot. And up here we have the, um, the geodetic precession of B as inferred from the changes in the eclipses of A, the Breton et al. paper. And we also have the mass ratio, big R here. 
right? So that's just M1A1 equals M2A2. Um, and that's a separate theory independent, at least to first post-Newtonian order constraint on, uh, on the masses. And so here's a blow up of the central region here. Not all of the parameters have made it down here. So these are the, the sort of crucial ones that we put into the test. So we have the Shapiro delay S curve, the time dilation parameter gamma in, in yellow here, orbital period decays in purple, and then the um, omega dot value is the set of lines here. Right? So um, basically this is the uh, naively measured omega dot. And then we have to, we're reaching the point where we have to start making this correction uh, based on the moment of inertia of the pulsar. So uh, the A pulsar, you know, having non-zero size is actually going to cause some spin orbit coupling. It will cause the orbit to process a little bit extra. And so this will um, effectively give us lens during precession of the orbit and change the value of omega dot a little bit. So exactly how much this is, is going to depend on the structure of the neutron star. And so that's illustrated by the range of uh, values here in gray. And we've got sort of a, a central value here for omega dot. Uh, for, yeah, omega dot. This is the, the naively measured value here. So to make a great measurement of the moment of inertia, we need the PB dot orbital period decay parameter to shrink down even farther and get that kinematic correction just right. And then we'll have a super measurement. For now, we do have a constraint needing to keep things within this purple region here. And you know the, the constraints are going in that direction. Um, oh yeah, okay. So I'll get back to that in, in a moment. I just want to talk about what else is necessary in the fit. So we have this relativistic deformation of the orbit. Here's a highly exaggerated uh, version of what that means with a with an eccentric orbit here and a large uh, delta theta parameter. So it, it makes the orbit a little more egg-shaped than, um, than it would otherwise be. Um, so this has been measured in the Hulse-Taylor pulsar that was published a few years ago, and we've got it now too. It is covariant with a gamma parameter, right? So we don't have a superb measurement of delta theta, but it is necessary to include it in the fit in order to get everything else to line up. So this is another one of those constraints that will um, go forward in, uh, in the future with better data. So coming back to the, uh, the moment of inertia constraints, um, you know, we'd like to put that into a bit of context based on uh, other recent attempts to, to do that. So here, the, the blue stuff is what, uh, what we infer from our uh, omega dot value. So this is the total mass here, which comes directly from omega dot. Um, and, you know, this is the, the moment of inertia here itself. So the, our blue regions here are our um, internally consistent measurements here. You can see there's still a bit of a range, right? Um, <coughs> So we haven't narrowed things down beautifully, certainly not in any separate way. Um, you know, there are other constraints here. Causality is just requiring that the, uh, the speed of sound be a, a reasonable value within the neutron star. So not faster than the speed of light. Um, here is the set of constraints on the, the moment of inertia, you know, based on previous estimates of the, um, what the equation of state could be. So Jim Latimer's work there. Um, but, you know, we have a limit on the, uh, the radius of A, not an exciting one, 22 kilometers at 90% at confidence. I mean, NICER is already doing better than that. So, we've, you know, we've got a couple of constraints from NICER here. Um, there's a constraint from the um, double neutron star in spiral with LIGO. And then just from looking at a Bayesian model of, uh, of everything. But, uh, you know, it's good that we have a constraint on the moment of inertia that is at least consistent with those. Right? And what we hope we can do with more time and better data is make this not an upper limit, but an actual measurement, right? So turn this into some kind of Gaussian here. So that is down the road, but it is nice that uh, we're starting to get there. 
Why is this not advancing now? Okay. So getting close to the end here, uh, I'll just show you a couple of examples of constraints on other theories of gravity. Excuse me. Um, so one that is commonly used is uh, de Mores Posito Ferrez gravity. And so this is one where you have a linear alpha knot and nonlinear beta knot uh, set of extra coupling parameters that, uh, you know, well, extra fields, I guess, that the neutron star could couple to. Um, and so any evaluation of that theory has to uh, you know, check a set of uh, values for these two parameters. So if the nonlinear component is zero, that actually corresponds to the Jordan Fjord's Brand Sticky theory. So that's in the uh, black line here. Um, so this is something that can be constrained by solar system measurements, or at least the uh, the alpha knot can, beta knot can't be. Uh, so you need the, the pulsar systems for that. Um, so Cassini uh, puts a nice limit on alpha knot, which is still important in certain parts of this diagram. Um, excuse me. And then uh, the uh, various pulsar constraints um, you know, are important at different values of beta knot. But you can see the double pulsar is uh, important here um, for, you know, low values of beta. It's restricting uh, things to be, um, you know, on this side of, of the line, right? So the allowed space is in part constrained by the double pulsar here. So that's useful. Um, another thing people often ask for is what does a mass mass diagram look like when you're not actually satisfying the self consistency check. So here's an example of that, um, a Tevez theory. So this is sort of, uh, you know, from the general Mond family of things with uh, the parameter of the theory set to 0.04. Um, and this is, you know, uh, not the full big picture, right? But uh, zooming in on what the, the masses should be um, and showing that you don't actually have internal consistency in this case. Right? So, I mean, Tevez as, as a whole, you know, LIGO sort of uh, ruled that out a little bit, but we just want to show that, you know, we can certainly do that as well here. So we've got the mass ratio, gamma is sort of way up north here and, uh, the other parameters, the Shapiro delay, PB dot and omega dot, they don't line up and you can't fiddle with the moment of inertia to get them to line up. There's, there's nothing to be done here, right? This is just a, an absolute failure of this theory with that particular parameter as an example of, of what we can do here. So just uh, to finish up, one other thing that we get out of the timing solution is the system velocity. Uh, and that's quite small, right? So it's only uh, 10 or so kilometers per second. And, um, you know, we don't know what the radial velocity is of the system. That's just not knowable. We have no spectral lines to, to go with. But given where it is in the galaxy and reasonable assumptions about, you know, that it was, you know, probably from some Maxwellian distribution of velocities, the overall velocity of the system is probably quite small also. So this ties in with the, um, you know, tiny misalignment angle of A, the fact that it's rotating prograde, um, because if you have the small system velocity, one of the implications of that is that the supernova event that produced pulsar B uh, was quite symmetrical. Right, it might have been one of these sort of uh, electron capture supernovae or um, ultra stripped helium progenitors that Thomas Torres likes to talk about. Excuse me. Um, so those types of supernovae are predicted to be much more symmetrical than your standard iron core collapse supernova, where you can get kicks of a few hundred kilometers per second in some cases. Here, you know, we've done previous modeling 15 years ago, even that suggested that the, the kick was uh, likely quite small in this case. And our new observations tie in with that beautifully. So this is the, uh, for different values of the, uh, the radial velocity, 
what the velocity relative to the local standard of rest at the pulsar would be. And you can see it's small in general. So again, this uh, ties in to all of the previous observations and uh, the, the coherent story that we've built over time. So just to leave you with a summary here, we have a bunch of new parameters. GR is perfectly compatible with the data, you know, to, uh, to a high level of precision. Um, other theories are not so far. There's, of course, still a little wiggle room in some of the parameters. So, you know, we haven't ruled anything completely out yet, except for really bad versions of Tevis. We can say definitively that Pulsar A is rotating prograde uh, relative to the orbit. And, you know, and additionally, we have a constraint on its moment of inertia. And then looking to the future, I mean, we're observing the system with Meerkat, which is actually even more sensitive than the Green Bank Telescope. Oh, shoot. No, I'm not taking that. Sorry. Um, so, uh, you know, the, uh, the data are going to be, um, excuse me, um, even higher precision there. And uh, that's something to look out for in the next couple of years. Um, it's going to be um, much, uh, much improved even over this, I think. And then, you know, in the long term, Canada is still a partner in the square kilometer array coming up. Um, that's going to, you know, by its nature, its distributed in nature, going to give a really good um, VLBI results and, uh, you know, pin down the distance even better. And, you know, it's also going to search for new systems. So maybe we're going to find something even more relativistic and, and providing even better tests of GR. So we'll stop there. I managed to fill out the hour quite nicely, but <laughs> I can stick around for some questions, that's for sure. Uh, great, thank you very much, uh, Ingrid. This is wonderful talk. Um, so uh, questions, I see uh, Rob. Uh, <laughs> yeah, hi, Ingrid, very nice talk. Uh, if, at the Tevis thing, I mean, you, you like 0.04 is ruled out. What was yeah. the reason for choosing that number? I, just to make an illustration. Oh, okay. There's yeah, nothing that's special that's about that in the theory. No. So, no, no. so the the upper limit on alpha is what now? You had the figure, but I like. Is it? Uh... Let's bring that back here. Um, so, well, so I mean, the double is if you're looking at at, at the moment Esposito Ferrez gravity. Yeah. Yeah. For so example. the double pulsar doesn't really contribute to to that so much, right? Um, these, I think this is different a moment of inertia assumptions, but I mean, basically Cassini still gives you the, the best limit on alpha and, and the double pulsar comes in more for the, the beta naught parameter. Oh, okay. All right. So that is a constraint on beta naught. Yeah, yeah, for from sure. There. I thought you said it wasn't earlier. That's just Cassini no. is. Yeah, so, is so, so Cassini, you know, that's the gray line here, right? So you yeah, can see okay. the other pulsars are in there, but, uh, you know, especially near the this sort of horn here, Cassini still right. important. Okay, and that star, what's the little star again on there? Uh, the honestly, I've forgotten right now. <laughs> I'd have to go all back right. and check the paper myself. All right, all right. Um, but beta is now pushed down to that value where those curves are basically. Yeah, right? so the red line here, so beta, oh, shoot. Uh, beta is constrained to be, you know, to, to the right of that, the double pulsar curve here. Okay. Okay, thanks, yeah. Uh, other questions? Uh, Mike, go ahead. So I, I missed this if you already said it, but you showed us right at the beginning the different individual pulse profiles, and then you showed sort of a, an average pulse profile. Yeah. The question that what, what wasn't clear to me is, is all the variation due to just noise or is there intrinsic variability in the pulse shape itself? No, I mean, the, the uh... It's intrinsic to the pulsar itself. So the emission region, you know, most of us think it's some kind of patchy region. So different bits of it light up at different times, but there's some overall envelope that things fall inside on average. So does it and then you do, you do have the interstellar medium contributing scintillation and whatnot too, but the timescales for that are longer than the individual pulse timescales. Okay. So is it just short-term variation? Like is the overall pulse profile steady over long or does that have long-term so, variations as well? Uh, well, that can, 
Uh, it's a complicated answer. I mean, in general, yes, it seems to be stable over very long terms. Um, there are pulsars that have two or three different emission modes or that actually null and turn off and, and so on. Um, so in some cases it jumps back and forth and sometimes you get what seems to be sort of smooth variations between um, time spent in each mode. This is getting beyond what I want to talk about here. Um, in general, they're stable. That said, um, you know, one of the millisecond pulsars that we're timing from for nanograv um, had a very abrupt profile change about a year ago, and it slowly worked its way back to what it was before. So we don't know what that's about, and it kind of freaks us out a little bit. Um, the, the, the sort of slow return to normal is especially disconcerting. Um, so, you know, there's a lot we don't know, but this must be some intrinsic thing to the pulse, uh, to the pulsar itself. Yeah, I mean, it's trying to get a feeling for how many like degrees of freedom there have to be in the modeling, <laughs> or what the ultimate limitation, well, so whether it's the pulsar profile itself or whether it's the interstellar medium or. Yeah, so, you know, our empirical experience is that in general, using the one average profile is a good assumption, right? And then we do the cross correlation. So we're we're using the profile itself rather than modeling it and then doing a cross correlation. So mm -hmm. that there's there's nothing really um, model dependent in that. Okay. If we do have long term changes, then you know we we have to work out how things. You know, we try in a couple of cases with processing pulsars, we have significant profile changes over the long term, and then we have to try to make um, you know, a set of standard profiles over time and try to align them, align the components with each other and all that kind of thing. So it, uh, that can get tricky. Yeah. You know, A is well behaved here, right? We've, we've really done a careful check on the profile over time and it doesn't change. So mm -hmm. it was kind of lucky for us in that sense. Good, thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, other questions for Ingrid? So maybe I actually asked one, I, I had a few that wrote, wrote down, but uh, the one that I think maybe first one uh, occurred to me was this idea that you don't get Kolmogorov spectrum from your uh, dispersion measures. Is this unique for this particular pulsars or generically, I mean, generically, do you get Kolmogorov for other well, pulsars? In, in some cases you get something very close to Kolmogorov, um, but you know, if you, if you do introduce a, you know, a sharp feature like the scattering screen, then you do see this this kind of deviation. So, you know, generally, excuse me, we don't th see things that are perfectly Kolmogorov, but mm -hmm. you know, in other cases, we do get fairly close. Okay. So, do you think they're that kind of by modality, or is it just all over the place? I, I would say it's more more all over the place. I mean, it depends. It depends on you know, the structure, the, the interstellar medium, you generically expect features like that here and there, right? So, you know. Yeah, I guess I was just wondering whether this called Mogorov is just, is there anything to it? Should we even take it seriously? Oh, perhaps? I mean, it's, it's a reasonable thing in general, right? So our interpretation of what we see there is basically Kolmogorov plus a scattering screen kind of thing. So mm -hmm. it's a reasonable baseline assumption, I okay. would still say. Okay, very good. It's uh, uh, 1240. Any other burning questions? If not, then hopefully next time we're going to have Ingrid in person here, and this one doesn't actually count. <laughs> uh, uh, okay, let's thank Ingrid again. Thank you. And take care, and hopefully you can have a proper breakfast now. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Take Bye. care. Bye-bye.